polarization is starting to pervade our local politics in a way that we actually didn't see for the last few years. So guess what? Even without Donald Trump in the White House, we're seeing major effects of deep partisanship. Good morning. This is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm Andrea Pineda Salgado. When it came to the midterm results, mainstream media got a lot wrong that local Black, Brown, and BIPOC media got right. And even now, they're still missing important stories, from big topics like abortion and climate change to garbage pickup or the PTA. So why is this happening? Recently, Epicenter publisher Mitra Kalita joined a roundtable discussion with other BIPOC journalists to answer that question. The discussion was hosted by broadcast journalist Laura Flanders. Today, we share highlights from that conversation. The results of the 2020 midterm elections have confounded the pollsters, the pundits, and the politicos who told us we should be prepared for a red wave of Republicans being swept into office. Of particular concern because of how many in the party have committed to 2020 election denialism and a rollback of democratic freedoms. That didn't happen, at least not at the national level, but local stories still reveal lots of threats to our democracy. Hidden beneath the headlines are the effects of gerrymandering, the extraordinary efforts many must still take to vote, and of course the election day procedures that give election deniers space to sow doubts. This month, our Meet the BIPOC Press Roundtable looks at how the media fared this election season, particularly in terms of communities of color, their priorities and their information needs. What do the media's hits and misses this time around tell us about what journalists need to do better or differently in the next few weeks and months? Mitra, coming to you in New York, a lot of people were surprised by the outcome. Governor Hochul, the Democrat, hung on, but five Republicans won in the House. Now, you and your reporter, Felipe de la Oz, at Epicenter, perhaps weren't so surprised. You'd been doing reporting on the rise of MAGA New Yorkers for weeks, maybe months. Can you talk about that? Felipe, as you mentioned, on October 13th, did a story about the MAGA forces of New York. And I think for mainstream media, I hadn't yet seen that story saying in New York, including New York City and South Brooklyn, Staten Island, but also parts of Queens, um, this polarization is starting to pervade our local politics in a way that we actually didn't see for the last few years. So guess what? Even without Donald Trump in the White House, we're seeing major effects of deep partisanship. Um, October 13th, Epicenter does this story saying these are the forces. October 18th comes the Quinnipiac polls saying Zeldin and Kathy Hochul are neck and neck. And sure enough, the reasons for that are what I'm outlining. Obviously, Governor Hochul made it through. But I do think it goes way beyond the governorship, to your point, right, that the map of New York between a combination of redistricting, but also these forces has been altered in a way that I think a lot of blue states and blue cities, while there was not a red wave in this election, I think blue states and blue cities cannot afford to be complacent at all. Mitra, again, you and Felipe were sounding an alarm about disinformation, particularly in Spanish language media and in Spanish language social media. Um, again, like a huge story. Why didn't this come up? There's such a difference between, I think, how largely white media is consuming and kind of the the both sidesism of our press tends to have us focus on Fox News as the misinformation versus very pervasive, constant. WhatsApp messages that are, um, and I use WhatsApp as, it's also Facebook, of course, it's Twitter, uh, it's direct text messages among communities. I mean, it really is truly pervasive. It's also very global. And I think that the way we cover elections is probably when America gets its most parochial, right? And um, that is a mistake. Uh, Habib mentioned 9-11 and the, and the period um after 9-11 in terms of affecting politics, I don't think our media caught up to the global forces that actually use a lot of the same tactics to um, misinform and disrupt communities. 
Um, so we've been doing a lot of stories around misinformation. Eyes wide open, stories about misinformation tend to perform just from a metrics perspective, who's reading them less well than the stories perpetuating misinformation. And so we, we received a grant from American Press Institute um, for the URL Media Network to better cover midterm elections. And so while we're focused on misinformation, we're also equally focused on what are we encouraging voters to vote for, right? What are the issues that they have control over at the ballots? What are the local issues? I mean, we, a lot, we got a lot of questions about climate change, abortion, for example. How do you as you're combating misinformation, still provide good information. Because one of the massive disconnects is mainstream media is covering misinformation and they're covering the polls. Right. They're not really covering abortion, climate change, your garbage pickup, your kid's PTA. I mean, these are the stories that I think all three of us have been mired in for the last few months. And especially, of course, that question of crime. And, and I encourage people to look at some of the reporting you all did contrasting the actual declining rates of murder, for example, in New York City with the increasing rates of coverage um, of the topic, something that clearly affected the electorate both in the LA area and in New York and other places uh, alongside. Um, what about the ballot initiative? initiatives, abortion, um, prison labor, uh, environment, uh, bail reform, all these things were up for votes and got some interesting results, more positive generally towards reform than the media, the white dominated media would have had you expect. Anything stand out to you? I really think this issue of ballot initiatives um, and the how-tos of how our network has operated has really struck me that um, over the last few months, uh, you know, we do the what the ballot initiative means. But here in New York, you know, Epicenter was literally telling voters, flip your ballot over. Like the, the actual mechanics of voting, we don't separate from the issues. And, you know, we've really tried to be rooted in our coverage, um, Laura. And so, you know, two headlines that the URL media network really didn't run that I saw a lot of mainstream outlets run with was, um, why is the GOP losing Latinos and for the most part? Well, there are, there are, um, you know, the same MAGA forces that we're talking about, um, Latinos by and large did vote um, Democratic. The second were, of course, Black males. Um, there was a narrative of, um, I'll use Georgia as an example to be concrete, you know, is Stacey Abrams um, losing the Black male vote? And um, we really didn't do those stories uh, to a little bit of what Stephanie's talking about that kind of pit communities against each other, but really tried to center um, the candidates and their narratives, as well as uh, communities and what they're voting again, what they're voting for. I want to come back to the big picture here, because paying attention to the constituencies that your media cover in the way that you cover is not just doing a favor to those constituencies, but is helping the country as a whole understand itself better. I would love you to lift up an example of, of a story that had the majority white media got right, um, we might have seen some different outcomes or at least some different expectations and perhaps some different work going in. I would say um, there's, if I could take two, one is the security at the polls continues to be a great concern among our communities. And so um, we received about 50 questions in response to our call out um, across the URL media network. We had seven partners who participated. Um, we received 50 questions. By and large, a lot of those questions were, will I be safe at the polls? How do I know that my vote is being counted? And so um, picking up on some of the back to basics of how voting works thread. I think that's an area that was not covered enough um, in the mainstream media. And we continue to do those stories. It's really informing our coverage for 2023 and 2024. The second is the Asian American vote in New York City. The last year really for the Asian community has been defined by a climate of fear. You know, stop Asian hate is not just a hashtag in our communities. There is real fear um, I'll say this as you know, the mother of two girls sending my kids out on the subway and really kind of giving them instructions on where to stand and um, how to behave and what to do if things go awry is very different from what that was a few years ago. And it's also a repeated message in Asian households like mine. I don't think the mainstream media have figured out how to cover this. I feel personally committed to figuring out how to cover this. In the meantime, we continue to raise these voices and 
um, and kind of very transparently yeah. um, not separate, um, you know, again, our communities from the policies that our communities need to be safe. During this conversation, Laura and Mitra were also joined by Habib Rahman, the co-founder of TBN24, the first Bangladeshi 24-7 live television channel in the U.S., and Stephanie Williams, the executive director of the IE Voice and Black Voice News. To watch the full discussion, click the link in our show notes or visit The Laura Flanders Show on YouTube at youtube.com slash at the LF show. Before we go, our new weekly update on MPV in New York City. Make sure to tune in for the latest information on vaccines, testing, care options, and much more. Hi, I'm Sam Zacker, back with this week's New York City MPOX update. Last week, we went over why the New York Department of Health is now referring to the virus as MPOX. To learn more, check out last week's episode. Today, why the MPOX vaccine is still encouraged despite falling case counts. In August, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency concerning MPOX. Now, given the low number of cases, HHS does not expect that it needs to renew that emergency declaration. Still, the HHS will continue to monitor the case trends and they encourage all at-risk individuals to get a free vaccine. Cases have slowed because of these vaccinations as well as behavioral changes. In fact, so far, more than 1 million doses of the Genios vaccine have been administered in the U.S. Remember, anyone can spread MPOX. Cases are primarily spread through sex and other intimate contact among social networks of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender people, gender nonconforming people, and non-binary people. So, if you have new or unexpected rash or sores, contact a health provider. And make sure to get vaccinated against MPOX if you may have been exposed or at risk of exposure in the future. Keep in mind that things are changing quickly. So if you have any questions or need help making a vaccine appointment, reach out to us directly at vaccine at epicenter-nyc.com or call 917-818-2690. Thanks for listening. Join us weekly for more news and information on MPOX in New York City. For more ways to get involved in your community, visit us at epicenter-nyc.com. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. And if you're not already a member, sign up today by using the link in our show notes. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Karavika. You can find more of their music on their website, linked to, in our podcast description.